Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I want to chat about the top five Victorian novels that I've read in the last five years. This video was specially requested by my friend Andrea at Infinite Text, whose channel I'll link down below. She might be taking a bit of a booktube break right now, but she has some really interesting videos about nonfiction and nature and historical trips and books about death and mushrooms and pirates. Her channel is really interesting. Anyway, she wanted me to do this video for Victober, and I thought it would be a fun way to review the Victorian literature that I've read over the past five years and pick out some of the highlights to discuss with you. This video doesn't include any rereads, so just keep that in mind if you're already trying to predict what's going to be on this list for me. The first book on this list is Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. I read this serially as part of the serialized reading project on Katie from Books and Things' channel about six years ago, but I finally finished it only five years ago in honor of Victober. I ended up disliking the serialized reading experience, but I loved Our Mutual Friend. There's a reason why it's Katie's favorite book of all time. This book has multiple plot lines which center around the death of a Mr. Harmon. He had made a fortune which was financed by profitable mounds of dust, or garbage. He basically owned garbage heaps and made money off of any valuables that were discovered there. Harmon's will stipulates that his estranged son, John Harmon, should inherit his fortune, but only on the condition that John Harmon marry a stranger named Bella Wilfer. However, in the very opening of the book, John Harmon, the expected heir to this large fortune, is discovered dead in the Thames River under mysterious circumstances. So, who will control old Mr. Harmon's fortune, and who killed John Harmon? This book untangles a large cast of characters who are all closely or distantly affected by the death of John Harmon, and in doing so, it provides a brilliant analysis and satire of Victorian society, including the importance of money, respectability, marriage, and so much more. It has a great cast of characters. I love Jenny Wren, who's a dolls dressmaker with a disability, and even though she's a child, she's forced to take on the role of an adult because her father is a bit of an irresponsible responsible drunkard. There's Bradley Headstone, the schoolmaster, whose story takes a very dark trajectory as he falls from respectability. And there's Lizzie Hexham, a strong female heroine who subverts the standard damsel in distress narrative. There are just so many great characters, and the way they all relate to each other and how their stories all intertwine in this book is fantastic. It's a really phenomenal book and one I encourage everyone to read and one I really want to reread, I think. The second book I want to talk about is The Half-Sisters by Geraldine Jewsberry. This was one of my favorite books of 2020, and it's absolutely amazing. But unfortunately, it is not the easiest book to obtain a copy of. It's out of print, but I really wish it would come back in print. So if you can find a copy, it's definitely worth reading. It's about two half-sisters. There's Alice, who's a rather conventional and respectable wife, but who's deeply dissatisfied with her dull and domestic existence. And then there's Bianca, who is half Italian and an unmarried actress. She leads an incredibly unconventional life for a Victorian woman. The book looks at the two women's contrasting lives and fates, how Alice struggles with her boredom of life, and how Bianca struggles with society's perceptions and prejudices towards her lifestyle. The Half-Sisters is actually rather radical for the Victorian era, and I love the way it looks at the relationship of women and work, and the way it examines Victorian morality. The writing is rather easy to read and surprisingly modern for a Victorian novel, so I highly recommend this book if you like Victorian literature and if you can get a hold of it. The third book I want to talk about is another book that's surprisingly ahead of its time with regards to gender, and that's The Odd Woman by George Gissing. I co-hosted a read-along of this book back in 2020, and it was another favorite of that year. The Odd Woman is definitely proto-feminist in the way that it deals with gender roles and women's rights and their changing positions in England in interesting ways. It looks at the odd women in society. They don't mean odd like strange or weird, but odd in the sense of uncoupled or unpaired, or in other words, unmarried women. The roles for unmarried women in the Victorian 
period were traditionally rather limited. It was expected that women marry and have children in order to have a meaningful and fulfilling life. But in the late Victorian period, when The Odd Woman was published, there began to be increased opportunities for unmarried women. It was published in 1893, so it's interesting to see how viewpoints are changing at that time, and it's also interesting to compare this to early Victorian works, just in terms of differences in society in general, the technology that's available, and so on. The Odd Woman looks at various single women and how they cope with spinsterhood and find meaningful places for themselves in a society that doesn't typically value their lifestyles. And in looking at single women, it also becomes a fascinating exploration and critique of marriage as an institution. It's a really interesting book in terms of gender and class, and it features one of the more interesting female characters I've ever read. One of the main characters, Rhoda Nunn, is this really stubborn and self-assured and unexpected character, and she's just a delight to read about. The fourth book I want to talk about is The Small House at Allington by Anthony Trollope. This was a favorite book of mine from last year, actually. It's the fifth book in the Barsetshire Chronicle series, and it's my favorite in the series so far. I do still have to read the last one, so we'll see if the title of favorite still sticks with this one. The Small House at Allington follows two sisters, Belle Dale and Lily Dale, who live in the Small House at Allington, which is next to the Great House at Allington, which is where their uncle, the squire, lives. Through their living situation and proximity to their uncle, they're afforded some of the advantages of someone with a title. But at the same time, it's really only through their uncle's attentions that they have access to the privileges of the upper classes. They themselves don't have the titles or the finances to back up that sort of lifestyle. And it's interesting to see how this precarious class situation affects their prospects of marriage. That's where the major plot and intrigue of this book comes into play. How involved would their uncle be in securing them successful marriages, and what class will they end up marrying into? I love how Trollope is able to portray these really nuanced familial ties and discuss what it means to be part of a family and the different responsibilities and duties that one has towards their family. And of course, it's really fun that we get to see some of the other characters from the Barsetshire Chronicle series in this book. Our old friends from the other books in the series crop up like Mr. Harding and Mrs. Grant and Lady Dumbello, and we're actually introduced to Mr. Palliser for the first time, who's part of a different Trollope series that I also might want to read someday. Trollope's writing is amazing. He always writes the most phenomenal characters and refreshing and engaging plots, and he does a really beautiful job of having characters whose stories overlap and can be compared with each other to illustrate his themes. If you haven't given Anthony Trollope a try yet, I highly recommend him, though this might not be the best place to start because it is the fifth in a series after all. Not that you have to have read the Barsetshire Chronicles in order, but I really do think you get more out of the series if you do. Last but not least, I want to talk about North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. I actually read my first Gaskell novel five years ago, and that was North and South. And five years ago was a great year for me and Gaskell because I actually read North and South, Cranford, and Wives and Daughters all in the same year, if my record keeping is correct. I could have honestly easily discussed all three of them in this video, but I thought I'd just chat about one Gaskell book today. North and South and Wives and Daughters are my two favorite Gaskell books, and if you make me choose my favorite, you'll get a different answer depending on the day you ask. But I decided to talk about North and South today because it doesn't get discussed enough on my channel, and I have a whole video about Wives and Daughters, which I'll link below if you want to hear me chat about that too. North and South is amazing. It's the book I recommend for people first getting into Elizabeth Gaskell, especially if they like Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like Pride and Prejudice with factories. North and South is about Margaret Hale, who moves with her family from the south of England to Milton, which is a manufacturing town in the north of England, and it's based on Manchester. The book is about the family's life there, their views of society, and how they adapt to their new environment and interact with some delightful characters that they meet up north. This book is a fascinating look at industrialization in the Victorian era, with complex characters and just a tiny bit of romance. It's a fascinating look at class and concepts of work and meritocracy. 
Do those of a higher class have a paternalistic responsibility to take care of the working class? Can the working class work hard enough to overcome their low birth? Looking at the character of Mr. Thornton and where he fits into the hierarchy of class is also really interesting. On the one hand, he's wealthy and well-respected up north, but on the other hand, he's uneducated and he's worked his way up from the bottom. The book explores unions and strikes and mob mentality in the workplace. Are the unions just as tyrannical as masters in their own way? And then I also thought that it was really interesting to compare the employee and employer or business relationship to Victorian concepts of the husband and wife relationship, which is something that I think the ending sort of encourages you to do. I love this book, and I also love the BBC miniseries of it, which is great fun to watch after you read. So those were the top five Victorian novels I read in the last five years. Talking about them kind of makes me want to reread them all. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you've read any of these books, I would love to hear what you thought of them. And if you haven't read them, do you think that you'll pick them up soon? What are your top five Victorian novels that you've read in the last five years? I'd love to hear all of your thoughts in the comments down below. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you in another bookish and likely Victorian video very soon. Bye!